2 Corinthians chapter 7. Wonderful chapter, isn't it? It's a wonderful chapter. You know what it is? It's a Paul is a church planter, which by default made him a pastor. And uh, as a result, he had relationships with churches. And this particular church in Corinth, he was having some relationship problems with. Do you ever have problems in your relationships with other people? Be it in the church or outside of the church, maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's with co-workers. Paul was having a terrible relationship problem with these people in Corinth. They were doubting his authority as an apostle. They were listening to different voices, and people were saying nasty things about Paul, and people in the Corinthian church, some of the people were believing them. And uh, they also had their favorite uh, preachers, and Paul wasn't uh, everyone's favorite either. So this passage, 2 Corinthians 7, is, I, I have it titled, How to Repent, but I could also title it, How to Repair Broken Relationships. We have them. How do you deal with them? How do you repair them? This passage is about repairing relationships or repenting of wrong that uh, has been done to others. And it is all based upon the fact of what he ended by saying in chapter 6, and that's this. We're all members of the same spiritual family. God's our heavenly father. We are brothers and sisters in the Lord. And we are in the same family, like it or not. And so we got to learn to get along with each other. And he says in the first verse of chapter 7, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved. What promises is he talking about? Again, the chapter divisions aren't inspired. They're there. They were put in by men to help us. But in chapter 6, he ends by telling us some wonderful promises that God promises in verse 16 to dwell in his people, to dwell in his church, to walk in them, to be their God. They be his people. That's family. He says in verse 18, I will be a father unto you. You'll be my sons and my daughters. Again, the promise is that we who are believers are joined to God. He's our heavenly father, and you and I are brothers and sisters. Hey, do you like me as your brother? <laughs> do you like your sisters and brothers in the Lord? This, These are the promises he's talking about. And he says, having these promises, dearly beloved, we need to take some action. We need to straighten things out. We need to repair broken relationships. And we do so, he says, by cleansing ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness, godliness, you might say, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Because we are family members, it ought to motivate us to live lives that are distinctive as the people of God, as the family of God, as children of God. Lives that Notice what he says in that first verse, that are morally clean. We don't use our bodies to fornicate. And that moral cleanliness, notice how he puts it there. Cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. That's moral clean, uh, cleanness. And he says, of the spirit, that is inner uh, uh, cleanness. And so... It The outward, the external, the moral cleanliness actually begins with an inward purity. And an inward purity, he told us in verse 16 of, of chapter 4, is a result of our inner man, our inner person, being renewed day by day. This is why it's so vital that you get into God's Word on a daily basis. Because it's in God's Word 
that our inner man, our soul is renewed and refreshed. And it's that inner renewal, it's that being washed by the water of the word where we're cleansed inwardly and we're refreshed and renewed inwardly, that then we have the basis for cleansing ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh, the externals, the, the, the moral purity that we're being called to here. Now, as I said, this chapter is about repentance because when there are broken relationships that need to be repaired, there are things that have to be gotten right, either on one part or on both parts. Whenever I have uh, had any marriage counseling to do, I always go into it realizing, okay, one of these may be more to blame than the other, but it takes two to tango. And so I realize that no one is totally uh, innocent when it comes to relationships that are broken, okay? And so relationships that are broken require repentance. You know, the Bible calls all human beings to repent. When Paul was on Morris Hill preaching to those Athenians, he says, this God that I'm making known to you has commanded all men everywhere to repent. So all human beings have to repent. Let me ask you a question. Do Christians need to repent? Yes. Believers need to repent. People that are saved still need to repent. And that's really what this chapter is all about. Whenever we hurt someone, whenever we lie, whenever we cheat, whenever we smear someone's reputation, whenever we treat other people disrespectfully, whenever we live in sin as believers, we need to repent. You know what repentance is? It simply means to change your mind and your attitude that, of course, will eventually result in a change of your actions. But it begins with a change of heart, a change of thinking, a change of your mind, your attitude that results in changed actions. And chapter seven is how to repair broken relationships through proper repentance how to heal and restore relationships instead of making things worse. And the first requirement found in verses two to four is you have to have a right approach. If you're going to repair relationships, you got to have a right approach. Let's see what that is after we pause a moment in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you the thanks and praise that we can gather together. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you that we have this clear direction and instruction and admonition and exhortation from you. And we pray that it would be profitable in our lives today. But Lord, we want to bring glory to you. The reason why relationships need to be repaired, the reason why believers need to repent or anyone needs to repent is first and foremost to be right with you and to glorify you. And then the fringe benefits that uh, spin off of that into our lives and other people's lives is just a blessing, a fringe. Lord, we just thank you today for how clear you are when you speak to us in your word. Would you do that today? Would you personalize your word to each individual life here? As you know our need, you know our heart, you look upon the heart. And so, Lord, speak accordingly. To the glory of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. In order to repair relationships that have been broken, we need to approach it the right way. Well, what's the right approach? Verses two to four gives us information here. Paul says, receive us, welcome us with open arms. We've wronged no man. We've corrupted no man. We've defrauded no man. Now, can I remind you, that because of the way these people were acting, Paul had sent them a severe blistering letter. 
I'm not sure if it's 1 Corinthians or if it's another letter that didn't make it into our Bible. But he references it in verse 8. He said, I made you sorry with a letter. But I'm not sorry that I sent it. <laughs> what he says as he opens up verse 8. So he had sent them a blistering letter of rebuke. And he was anxiously waiting for the response from the Corinthian church. You know, let me just say this. One of the essential qualities of a spiritual leader is that a spiritual leader has a capacity to inflict pain in the lives of the people that he is spiritually leading. Not just to hurt them, but like a surgeon. I hate going to the dentist, don't you? Because I've never met a dentist or had a dental appointment that didn't hurt to some degree, some less than others, but they all hurt. Can you imagine what it was like before they had Novocaine and Lidocaine, all the whoa. But anyway, that's beside the point. The point is this, as much as it hurts to go to a dentist or to have a necessary surgery, the pain is inflicted for a purpose. It brings about a healing as a result. And I believe that one of the qualities of, of a true spiritual leader is that they have the ability to inflict pain like a, a surgeon because people have to hurt before they can be healed. And what Paul is saying here, what he has to say to them, the right approach is that I'm not doing this to attack you, to accuse you, to condemn you. He's being careful to share three very important things with them. And this is the right approach to restoring broken relationships. Number one, in verse two, he talks about his personal innocence. He basically says in that second verse, look, I have a clear conscience before God. And before we can heal any hurt in relationships with others, we need to deal with any blame on our own part. And Paul had done that. In fact, Jesus said it this way. He said, before you try to remove that, that little speck of sawdust out of uh, your brother's eye, get the log out of your own eye so that you can see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. Or to put it another way, Jesus said this, when you come to worship me with your gift at the altar and you come and recognize that you are have a broken relationship with a brother in the Lord, Go and restore that relationship first, and then come worship me and offer your gift. So he says in that second verse, receive us. Literally, open your arms and welcome us. Make room for us. Can I ask you, is there anyone that you are in a broken relationship with that you need to make room for? You need to receive them. You need to welcome them. The first step in a right approach is that you have a clear conscience that there is innocence on your part between you and the Lord. And then the, the second right approach is in verse 3. He says, I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that we are, that you're in our hearts to die and live with you. The second thing is not only innocence, but what I would call here reassurance. He's writing this letter right here, not to condemn them, but rather to reaffirm his love for them. He's speaking the truth to them, but he's doing so in love. And that's how we got to do it. Our tone how we couch our words are so very important. He's giving reassurance to them. He's pointing out their wrong, but he is assuring them that regardless of what they have done, he supports them. Regardless of their action, he supports them. He is so supportive of them 
it, he says, whether it be life or death, look, it's all about you. It's not about me is what he's saying. I, I don't care what happens to me. I just want you to be well. I want you to be emotionally and, and spiritually healed. So he gives them reassurance, innocence, reassurance. And there's a third thing that I think makes up a right approach to restore these broken relationships and, and bring about repentance. And in the fourth verse, he says, great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorying or boasting of you. I'm filled with comfort. I'm exceeding joyful in our trials and our tribulation. What is he expressing there? Nothing less than confidence in these people. And it's confidence because he has been encouraged because of the good report that he's received. Later on, down in verses six and seven, he says, God comforts those that are cast down. And I was comforted by the coming of Titus, verse seven, not just that Titus came, but he came from you. Uh, and and uh, you comforted him, and he told us of your earnest desire, your 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 mourning, your fervent mind toward me. So I rejoice the more. So his confidence is really high. After having not only had Titus return from Corinth, but return with a good report that the people in Corinth had a change of heart that comforted Paul, that encouraged Paul. And so he's proud of these people in the right sense. He's overjoyed despite the, the very uh, difficult circumstances, trials, tribulation that he's facing. He's joyful. He's comforted. He's encouraged. So a right approach is, first of all, innocence. Make sure you have a clear conscience before the Lord. And then reassurance that you're not coming to condemn them, but you're coming in love, to speak the truth in love. And then confidence that you're, you're thankful that uh, and you're encouraged by the fact that these people are willing to make things right. And there's a second main idea that I want to share with you in restoring broken relationships and repenting properly. Not only does it require a right approach, but secondly, I would say it requires a right attitude. Let's pick it up in verse 5. He said, for when we were coming to Macedonia. Now, what's happened here is that Paul got anxious. He was filled with anxiety about what was going on there in Corinth, and he couldn't sit still. And so he, he, he left, and he went to Macedonia to find, uh, to track down um, Titus, so that he could get a quick report and, and, and find out what's going on. How are these people taking that severe letter of rebuke that I sent them? When we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, uh, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Without, well, there were rivalries there in the church at Corinth. Uh, there were people, as I said in our introduction, that were saying, you know, fully with Paul, we're going to go with this guy. Well, I don't know if Paul's really, you know, genuine. This guy, we will. And so there's rivalry. There's rival. There's that uh, fighting without. Plus, not to mention the persecution that Paul's facing every place he goes, every city he goes. There's fightings without. And then he says, Fears within. And I think that that is very clearly Paul saying, I am just full of anxiety. I'm having an anxiety attack. But look at what he did with it. And I hope you get the, the, the right picture here. Just because someone is an apostle or a pastor or a church planter or in full-time ministry, doesn't mean that they don't have the same type of emotions and have to struggle with the same type of sins that everyone else struggles with. Here he's admitting, I'm filled with anxiety. Later on, he's going to say, I was in depression. I was depressed by all of this. He says, without fightings, within fears, anxious, 
What do you do with anxiety, by the way? Well, you do what Paul does with it. You, do you have anxiety attacks? You know what Paul learned to do? And what we all have to learn to do with that kind of stuff? Give it to God. He gave it to God. Did you know that one of the main ways that Satan seeks to defeat us spiritually is by bringing anxiety, stirring anxiety deep in us? It might be our personality anyway, but Satan will whip that up as best he can. In fact, we are told by Peter, casting all your care upon him, all your anxiety on him, because God cares for you. And then in the next verse, he says, be vigilant, be on the watch, because your adversary, your enemy, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Having cast your care upon the Lord, you can resist him. The devil will gobble you up. He'll eat you or eat your lunch, whatever you want to call it, with anxiety. If you don't learn to give it to the Lord, that's one way that believers live defeated lives. Paul was in a, a place where he was just torn up with anxiety until he learned to give it to God and defeat the enemy that way. In fact, uh, he goes on to say, in the next verse six, nevertheless, God that comforted those, notice, that are cast down. The word cast down, we could translate that depressed. He was anxious. He had anxiety. He was depressed. But the answer to that is God encouraged him. You got to let God encourage you. You got to let God comfort your heart. And, you, and that doesn't come if you stay away from God. If you don't open the scriptures, if you're not searching the scriptures, you're not going to get God's comfort. This is, this is a book of comfort for depressed and anxiety-attacked hearts, this book. It's God's way of comforting his own people. you got to get God's encouragement. Cast your care upon him. Exchange your anxiety for his peace. And you may not do that immediately, but you got to get to that. Paul had to get to that because he was anxious and depressed. So what's the right attitude then in restoring these broken relationships? Well, let's pick up the next verse 7. Uh, how that he was comforted when he hooked up with Titus again. But he says in verse 7, it was not only encouraging to me that I had Titus again with me, but that his report from you really encouraged me. He said, he told us of your earnest desire of you actually mourning your fervent mind, Paul said, toward me. So I rejoice the more. The right attitude is, of course, it involves correction. And Titus's report from the Corinthian church revealed to Paul that the Corinthian church had a right response toward correction. How do you respond to correction? How do, re, how do you respond when you do wrong and someone steps up and confronts you? You see, a right attitude to correction is very important in the restoration of broken uh, relationships. It's a part of getting right, of repenting. How you respond to, relation, uh, to, to correction. You know, the book of Proverbs, of course, is full of God's wisdom. But the book of Proverbs is constantly making reference to people who are called foolish because they resent correction. And when they get corrected, they blame other people or they blame God or they criticize uh, the people that uh, seek to correct them. But in the book of Proverbs, the wise are people that gladly take correction and they learn from it and they apply it. So how do you take correction? The right attitude in the restoration of broken relationships is that you 
approach correction like that wise person in the book of Proverbs. Very important. And in verse 8, here's the second thing. Not only does it have to do with correction, but a right attitude has to do with compassion. Look at how Paul put it. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I, I don't regret that. Though I did at first, for I perceived that the same letter that made you sorry, it was for a season. And I don't rejoice that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. You know what Paul's doing here in this eighth verse and, and the following? He's expressing a great concern for these believers, his spiritual family. And he's basically saying, you know what? I, I, I was extremely reluctant to try to correct you, but I have to. That's real love, to lovingly confront. You know, that's why the Bible says that he that is spiritual should restore a fallen brother or sister in meekness. He that is spiritual is someone that is filled with God's compassion in the confrontation that has to take place, in the correction that has to be uh, uh, put forward. He's extremely reluctant to correct, but he has to lovingly confront. After mailing that severe letter, Paul is saying in this eighth verse, I had second thoughts about it because I knew it would hurt, but at the same time, I knew that this hurt was going to be necessary if you're ever going to get healed. Listen to me. You don't love someone when you are not willing to tell someone the truth. When you risk a friendship, a relationship, to tell someone that you love the truth in love, that's real love. And so there's compassion that is part of the right approach. Correction, compassion. And look at the conclusion in uh, verse 9 and 10. I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance to deliverance, salvation, not to be repented of, not to, be, not to change your mind back. But he, he says, but the sorrow of the world, it does the opposite. It works death. When someone confronts you because they see wrong in your life and that person lovingly tells you the truth about yourself, you can deal with it two ways. Number one, you can respond in a humble, gracious manner. Or number two, you can react in a proud, angry way. And there's two Bible characters that really will illustrate this. He calls it godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow, or godly grief or hurt versus worldly grief or hurt. You know who had a godly sorrow? Our friend Peter. You remember when he denied the Lord three times? And the Lord comes out of Caiaphas's house and uh, the Lord's eyes meet Peter's eyes. And Peter was broken hearted when he saw the look that Jesus gave him. And it says that he went out and wept bitterly. That's a godly sorrow. On the other hand, that disciple that betrayed the Lord, Judas. Oh, he had sorrow. Remember after he, he, he realized that Jesus was going to be killed because of his betrayal. He took the 30 pieces of silver back to the temple and he tried to give it back to the high priests and he wouldn't take it. So he threw it on the ground and he ran out and he went and hanged himself. That's a worldly sorrow versus a godly sorrow. Peter versus Judas. Well, let's look at the godly sorrow. This is the proper way to repent. It's to respond graciously. It's 
a godly hurt where you suddenly become aware about uh, of something that you have previously tried to cover up and hide. It's a moment of self-awareness, a moment of truth, like Peter had when his eyes and Jesus' eyes locked on one another. That kind of godly hurt, it leads to a change of thinking. It leads to an agreement about the, the what to, you are being uh, confronted about, and that will produce an actual change in the way that you act. You do a 180. I'll give you another example of that. When Peter was preaching on that wonderful day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, at the end of his sermon, all of a sudden, a bunch of Jewish men that were listening to the sermon cried out and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent. And they did. 3,000 of them repented and their lives were absolutely changed. That's responding graciously. That's a godly sorrow, a godly grief or hurt. But he also talks here about a worldly sorrow where people react angrily, where they have a worldly sorrow, a worldly grief or hurt, where they become defensive when they're confronted with wrongdoing, or they become argumentative about it, or they try to strike back. They try to come up with something that they can somehow justify their actions. But deep inside, they know what has been said to them is true. They may feel sorry. They may regret it. But it's not repentance. And uh, they may outwardly conform, but it's not an inward heart change. That's worldly sorrow. So there are two kinds of repentance that are possible in human experience. One, it's a sorrow of the world in which is a feeling that is induced by fear of getting caught or already being caught. And many recognize that there are unpleasant consequences to their sin. And so they're persuaded that they're guilty. But And so that results in a superficial sorrow that may lead to a temporary re reforming of oneself, but it's not a genuine turning to Jesus for forgiveness. Then there is a godly sorrow. That is accompanied by the conviction of sin. It's the Holy Spirit's work where the individual realizes, I have offended a holy God, and I have offended my holy brethren, God's family. And it leads to genuine repentance. And there's a radical, someone said there's a radical distinction between natural regret and God-given repentance. They said the flesh can feel remorse, acknowledge its evil deeds, and be ashamed of itself. However, this sort of disgust with past actions can quickly be shrugged off, and an individual can soon go back to his old ways. None of the marks of repentance described in, in 2 Corinthians 7 here are found in that kind of behavior. I wonder... Is there anyone listening to me today that needs to come clean with God and repent and restore broken relationships? There is a third and final ingredient that I think is very important. Not only a right approach and a right attitude, but the rest of the chapter, verses 11 to 16, there is a right adjustment that has to take place. You ever gone to a chiropractor? When your back is out of, uh, uh, you know, it is twisted and you need a, a chiropractic adjustment. Well, we need spiritual adjustments. When relationships are out of joint, when relationships are broken, we need to have a spiritual adjustment, a right adjustment. And here in verse 11 in particular, we are given clear-cut proofs of what godly sorrow, what a godly grief, what a godly hurt really looks like. Look at the responses of it. 
in verse 11. He says, Behold, this self same thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort. Now he's going to describe the responses of a godly sorrow. You ready? In verse 11, he said, What carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves. There are actually three main ingredients, I believe, in a gracious, humble response to being lovingly confronted. And by the way, even if you're unlovingly confronted, if it's right, you need to have a humble, gracious response. What does that amount to? What does that look like? He tells us, first of all, it involves a reversal. That you are eager. That's what he says here. What carefulness you wrought. What eagerness you wrought to clear yourself. An eagerness to completely clear or clean yourself of all wrongdoing. No cover-up. No sidestepping it. No glossing over it. But rather laying the whole thing out and dealing with it biblically. That's godly sorrow. It's a reversal of your behavior. You want to do all you can to clear, uh, to clean your reputation, to get things right with God and right with whoever else might be involved in this broken relationship. But also, look at what else he, he describes it. He says, yea, what indignation. What indignation, what, what, uh, what fear, what vehement desire. What's he talking about there? You know what indignation is? It's anger. There's a godly sorrow that has a, a righteous anger about it. And what he's talking about is that you are angry with yourself. <laughs> that you own your own stupidity and your own failure. And that you become upset with yourself that you ever allowed yourself to fall into this mess. It's a righteous indignation. It's an anger at yourself for your part, for what you've done. That's godly sorrow. He says this is the elements that really define someone that really is sorry for their sin. It's not mere words. And then there's a third ingredient. He says, uh, what zeal or passion? What revenge? There's a revenge. There's a desire to avenge in a godly sorrow. Well, what in the world would that mean? Because you're angry at yourself. There's a caution. You put up caution flags. And uh, you, you want to be careful going forward in the future because you don't ever want to repeat this again. And so there's a vengeance on your part to never repeat this. You want to put spiritual deterrence in place. And I think it also re uh, uh, applies to taking action to do whatever is necessary to make things right. To bring justice to the situation. Hey, when you have been responsible for a broken relationship, you need to do all you can to make that right. I think you ought to say, and, and this is what we would teach our children, when you, you need to come to that person that you have hurt and you need to say to them, look, I did such and such, and I'm sorry, and I'm asking your forgiveness. Will you please forgive me? And then what can I do to make it up to you? What can I do to make this right? How can I uh, bring justice to what I've done? This is godly sorrow that he's talking about here. This is the kind of responses that that requires. And the, and the reasons are in verses 12 and 13. And basically it's this because really, personally, I'm unimportant. I just want the old confidence in the relationship that we had previous to be reestablished. 
One of the things that is very clear as a, a pastor, no spiritual leader can have ministry with people in the congregation that don't place total confidence in him. And the Corinthians responded right to the correction that Paul gave them so that he then could have ministry with them. The reason for a godly sorrow is, look, if there is a, a broken relationship then uh, between you and me, I can't minister to you. This is how important this is. And the results, he goes on to say, and uh, I boasted, verse 14, uh, I have boasted uh, of uh, to him, to Titus, of you. In other words, I'm proud of you. I've praised you. And I have a mutual joy that, uh, that we share together, Titus and I. Verse 16, I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. The relationship that was broken has been repaired, and Paul is just thrilled. He's overjoyed. He's comforted. He's encouraged. He's just full with joy that God has worked in these people's hearts. Now, I wonder, as we bring this to a close this morning, if there is a particular broken relationship in your mind that the Holy Spirit of God is putting his finger on right now, or has. And I wonder if you would be willing to let God work in you a godly sorrow that you might, in the right attitude, with the right approach, make the right adjustments that are necessary. I wonder if you will repent. The repenters, which are Christians, need to repent. I wonder if you need to repent today and get things right. Not only with God, but with your family. Your biological family. Your spiritual family. We're all family here. And we are to love one another. And sometimes the most loving thing that we can do is to lovingly confront each other with the truth that God would have us to, to share.